today I will speak, um, of course, not only on, about the methodological issues, uh, but also about some context-related issues. But before doing this, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Agnes tanzel Piontak. Um, I'm working at the Research and Analysis Unit of the IEADPC, which, which is a, an international association for the evaluation of educational assessment. And uh, in particular, DPC is concerned with data processing and uh, is, it is also a research center. My promotion uh, is in educational research, just to give you some uh, background. So the presentation, probably the topic of, of the presentation um, is not strictly, strictly in psychological research, however, it is also concerned with it. Um, my main research interests are social inequalities, school effectiveness research, and uh, of course methods in large-scale assessment studies, in particular structural equation modeling and multi-level modeling. So the title of my presentation is Learning in Schools, Individual Classroom and School Factors Mitigating Social Inequalities. I was thinking about this presentation and um, my aim is today to take you on a journey and to activate your thinking on social inequalities. And in order to do so, I would like to put some basic theories on the reproduction of social power and the rational choice theory. This will be a very brief overview. Uh, then I would like to point out the role of the school system in the reproduction of social inequalities and also present to you like a very short summary of the research results. Um, but in the second step, I would like us to step back and to reflect a little bit on the social reproduction in the um, sociological context on different levels of the society. And the question would be, who is responsible? Is it the whole society? Is it the, the single school, the local school? Or probably is it a teacher, a principal in the school or an individual? Um, furthermore, I will present to you a research example from my own research, which is on school potential to mitigate social inequalities. And um, uh, last but not least, I will um, mention some issues on cultural um, cr cross-country country comparisons and the cultural component of it. Uh, don't worry, this is the funny part of my presentation, so I kept it, kept it for the last part so that we are um, capable at the end. I will start up with the theoretical foundations. Um, first of all, I will very briefly present to you the, cultural, the concept of cultural, social and economic capital of, uh, in Bourdieu's theory of social power. And then I will mention some applications in recent societies. Um, the very basic concept or the very, very basic uh, assumption in Bourdieu's theory is that the social world is uh, accumulated history in which the mechanisms of action are based on capital and its accumulation. So this is very basic for, um, for his uh, theory. What he's uh, basically assuming is that the social world is surrounded around the accumulation of uh, uh, capital and it is um, directed um, mechanisms that helps uh, individuals to accumulate it. And he defines the capital as accumu accumulated labor. It can be in materialized form or incorporated embodied form, which when appropriated on a private that is exclusive basis by agents or groups of agents, enables them to appropriate social energy in the form of reified or living labor. This means basically that Bourdieu understands capital as um, materialized or incorporated possessions that an individual have. And these possessions, uh, when they are accumulated on a private basis, they allow uh, the individuals to, to uh, use it for, um, as social energy or um, living labor. So the further assumption is that the capital is inscribed in objective and subjective structure of the social world, but also it is inscribed in the underlying um, and underlying the immanent regularities of the social world. So it is, it is inscribed in both the uh, structure and the mechanisms. The capital takes time to accumulate and it reproduces itself. Uh, so it is very persistent and this is a lack, of course, for those who have capital because it is easy to reproduce capital, or more or less easy, but it has the tendency to reproduce itself. Uh, it will become more clear when I uh, will present the different concepts of capital that Bourdieu defined. So, to sum up, the capital is a force 
inscribed in the objectivity of things so that everything is not equally possible or impossible. And this uh, statement is really, really very much related to social inequalities. Of course, when, uh, social capi when the capital uh, allows or enables for different things and it is not equally distributed across uh, the society, it leads to social inequalities. So these are, are the three forms of capital that are defined uh, by Bourdieu. So he describes the economic, cultural and social capital, uh, a concept that is very well, widespread and well known uh, recently. Especially the social capital is made up of social obligations, uh, which can be also called uh, like connections or social network. And uh, those three forms differ in terms of comfortability in, and institutionalization. So it means that uh, the economic capital is immediately and directly convertible into money, which is not the case for the cultural and social capital. Uh, they, there have been some conditions to be fulfilled to be able to transform uh, cultural and social capital into the economic capital. The institutionalization of the form of the economic uh, capital is in form of property rights. Uh, the institutionalization of the form of the uh, cultural capital is in form of educational qualifications and the social capital can be institutionalized in the form of title of novelty, which is not so often the case, right? Especially uh, concerning the social capital, because it is probably not that obvious how this, uh, this capital contributes to, to living circumstances. Uh, the social capital is the aggregate of the actual or potential resources which are linked to a membership in a group. So that provides each of its members with the baking of the collectivity owned capital, a credential which entitles them to credit in the various senses of the world. So this means that uh, social capital is um, a capital that is accumulated in a social network of an individual, and this provides the base and also a credit that can be used in uh, several situations. And the trustworthy of an individual uh, is depending on the amount of uh, our own, of the own capital of an individual, which means that, of course, um, um, having higher capital itself helps uh, individuals to be trustworthy and to uh, be able to use the capital that is embedded in the social network uh, in a better way. Probably the more interesting uh, capital form in a school context is the cultural capital. And it can have three different states. Uh, the one is the embodied state, which is also defined as habitus by Bourdieu. It is a, also a very wide, widespread concept. And he defines um, this state as a form of long-lasting long dispositions of the mind and body. And this is the form of capital which is the most difficult to accumulate. Then uh, there is the objectified state in form of cultural goods like pictures, book, dictionary instruments, etc. And the institutionalized state as objective certificates of educational qualifications. Interesting thing about the habitus, which is the incorporated cultural capital, is that it is a precondition for the fast and easy accumulation of every kind of useful cultural capital. And this is very much related to the school context. Um, so uh, Bourdieu also states that this is the best hidden form of the transmission of capital throughout the generations. Concerning the convertibility of the capital, it is probably important to mention that those different types of capital can be derived from the economic capital, but this is connected with different costs of effort and also with transformation costs. And the transformation costs are um, loss that occurs when transforming one form of the capital to the other. And the convertibility of the different types of capital is the basis of the strategies that are aimed at ensuring the reproduction of capital across generations. So how is all this related to the reproduction of social inequalities in the school system? Um, first of all, being a prerequisite for further learning, students' cultural capital influences their achievement. Especially the cultural capital of uh, small children um, is, uh, can be defined as their cognitive abilities, but also attitudes and motivation towards learning. This means that socially advantaged children attend school better prepared, in particular having higher cognitive abilities. Um, and benefit more from learning during the schooling time. 
And um, this is the so-called Matthew effect. For unto everyone that has shall be given. So the more you bring with you into the schooling system, the more you can benefit from it. But it is also related to the concept of the middle class school uh, as defined by Bourdieu and described. Um, and his assumption is, or uh, basically also his empirical results has shown that the school, at least at that time uh, where he uh, did the analysis, that the school uh, was more suitable for middle class children concerning the materials, the expectations of teachers, uh, teaching way, etc. So of course, uh, uh, being a middle class ch child, uh, you, uh, the children could profit more and benefit more from the learning in schools. There has been uh, some criticism on Bourdieu's theory, uh, especially uh, concerning the application to recent societies, uh, because Bourdieu assumes that the society is strictly stratified across social classes, and he's just considering this vertical, vertical stratification. Uh, but of course, recent changes in modern societies uh, related, among others, to improved education accessibility, as well to, to globalization processes. Uh, have uh, resulted in a kind of relaxation of the association between social class and life chances, which means that um, the social class doesn't determine the future life chance. And the society is more diverse, which is related to different lifestyles and also varying social milieus. And there has been a plenty of theories on that topic, uh, defining uh, another type of stratification called horizontal stratification. So what does this, uh, all this mean for the empirical analysis then? Um, I think uh, that Bourdieu's uh, classification is still applicable and this is, uh, is, is widespread used simply because it is uh, somehow possible to operationalize this concept, whereas the social milieu theories are very difficult to operationalize. Um, but the horizontal inequality should be taken into account as well. Uh, that is that social classes are more heterogeneous in terms of life conditions, chances and styles. Uh, of course, this makes the analysis more complex. And in the school system in particular, if the vertical inequalities are taken into account exclusively without considering the horizontal uh, inequalities, it is su supposed to result in lower cor correlations. So the association between social class and student outcomes should be more relaxed as there is more diversity within classes. So we have not only those diversity between the classes that Bourdieu described, but also within each class, there is a certain level of diversity. Next, I would like us to take a, a look on rational choice theories, um, especially on the economic-based approach to rational choice and sociological extensions, and also to look on Boudin's contribution to the theories of uh, social inequalities. So in general, the rational choice theory provides a framework to describe and formalize social and economic behavior of individuals. And this is um, related, of course, to, for example, uh, school track choices um, by parents and children and to different investments in education uh, in early childhood. So the rationality is based on the assumption that every human being action can be described as an action towards profit maximization which is supposed to be directly related to happiness. And this is, uh, as you see, there is the link between um, the accumulation of capital and uh, profit max maximization. So accordingly, individuals aim to maximize personal advantage through balancing costs and benefits. And uh, this theory assumes that the same is done uh, in terms of educational decisions. Individuals estimate the probability at which a desired event would occur under cer certain conditions. So what happens basically is uh, that it is assumed that individuals, every individual's decision and behavior is based on these mechanisms of costs and benefits, fits, um, bal balancing and uh, estimating the probability of uh, success. Um, how precise this estimation is depends on, uh, mainly on those two conditions, the number of available options and the level of risk associated with the particular decision. In the, context, in the school context, parental and students' decision on their school career are high risk, long-term investments that require the prediction of time inconsistent factors such as working space conditions or the development of the child. This makes the decisions, of course, unsecure and risky. 
The decision-making process in sociological rational choice theories is described while considering the historical and societal background of individuals. So this is the add-on from the sociological uh, side to the uh, economic-based theories. Um, it, is, uh, it is described as being based on long-term relationships and exchange bet between individuals. Um, so it is assumed that the social interaction does not refer to an abstract market, but to a concrete interaction with specific individuals within a particular time period. Um, and the decisions depend not only on the external conditions, but also on the specific learning history of the individuals. So you see that in sociological theories, the individual comes into the, into, into the consideration. And social inequalities, in this sense, social inequalities of young adults can be treated as an aggregated side effect of socially selective educational decisions during their school career. This is an particular perspective that you can take on social inequalities of young, ad young adults. And uh, of course we can ask us which aspects of decision making are socially selective and it is assumed uh, that the costs are socially selective, which means that, for example, the information proc procurement, psychological and monetary costs. Um, this means basically in the school context that a particular amount of money that you, uh, a family has to invest in the education of their children means something different to somebody from uh, disadvantaged uh, families and uh, then it means to uh, somebody from a rich family background. Um, the profit is also different, namely the social and economical benefit from education investments uh, like job, job opportunities, working and living conditions and social position and power. Um, so not only that children from disadvantaged backgrounds can um, have to invest more to uh, reach the same level of education or a higher level of education, but uh, it is also well known and uh, empirically uh, supported that they profit or benefit less from their educa education. And this leads, of course, to socially selective educational career decisions. And Boudon, um, when Boudin comes in, um, he, is, uh, he contributed to the theory of um, social power uh, in a particular manner. I will explain it to you in a second. But first of all, uh, he defines those two different kinds of social inequalities, which are related to the uh, points I mentioned previously. So he defines the inequality of educational opportunity, and this is obvious in achievement differences that correspond to the social background of students. But then also he defines the inequality of social opportunity, and this is related to social success, which corresponds to the individual's social background. And the level of social inequalities in a society depends on, those, on both factors. So um, this means basically that a school system can try to improve the, the learning and, uh, for disadvantaged children, and uh, it can aim on uh, providing equal uh, opportunities. Nevertheless, uh, we have this other component, the inequality of social opportunity, and uh, when the entire society and the market doesn't, are not going in the same direction, then the effect probably will not be, not be very high. So when the students are from socially disadvantaged families, the probability of attending high school is lower, but also the probability of a professional career is lower. The inequality of educational opportunity reflects the social specific system of values and disposition which influences the definition of social success and the way of achieving it. And those social specific values are specific to social classes, of course. But uh, what is new by Boudon is that he's assuming that those um, uh, social specific values are also subjective at the same time. So this is his difference to Bourdieu. He's assuming that uh, subjective perception of the reality plays a role in, in uh, building these um, values. Um, so to, to contrast those two points of view, I would like to summarize Bourdieu's a deterministic association between social position, rational habitus and action. Uh, so he's assuming that the subjective rationality is completely determined by the social uh, class and it is subject to the market and the individual's social position. And he defines this rational habitus that occurs as socially non-equal dispositions and abilities that are required for choosing the best strategy. 
and it is determined by the interaction between the market and the individual social possession. Uh, for educational choices, this means that the lower the capital is, the lower the social power and capacity to support the educational career, and the more fatal it is in case if the investment isn't successful, of course, when a family has to invest more, I mean subjective more, then uh, uh, lack of success is perceived as being worse, and the more the decision is perceived as being risky. Boudin, uh, however, defines this association between, between these three factors as non-deterministic. So, uh, according to him, behavior is subject to ideology and beliefs that are based on knowledge, and this knowledge might be based in research or simply be everyday knowledge, and it isn't necessarily objective, but it is also not irrational. It is based on the so-called subjective rationality. So according to him, decision-making depends on the social position of an individual and his dispositions, which are not completely determined by, by the social position, but are subject to communication, for example, media, through media and epistemological beliefs. However, it is not that individuals don't, would act irrational, but the concept of subjective rationality implies that the objective rationality is limited through circumstances and individual cognitive conditions. And this is important for the school system because um, in the context of educational choices, um, instead of analyzing the absolute distance between the social position of the family and the educational goal, Boudon regards its relative distance. So he argues that it is not appropriate to speak about low aspirations of families uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds when uh, children doesn't want, don't have like plans of uh, studying and uh, achieving the highest goals. Um, the aspirations uh, should be measured by this relative distance. So how, uh, how long is the way that child has to pass to reach a goal? Children have to pass a longer distance to achieve a particular educational goal than children from advantaged families. And the level of aspiration concerns the capability and willingness to manage a particular distance while making educational choices. What does this mean for the interpretation of the results in analysis? This means that when disadvantaged families choose lower school tracks, it shouldn't be described as low aspirations, as I mentioned before, when the relative distance isn't taken into account. But on the other hand, what does this mean for the educational system? Even though from the perspective of an individual the relative distance is more meaningful, uh, from the perspective of the school system, the interest is solely in the educational level reached. Of course, in later life, uh, it doesn't matter so much which distance you had, uh, an individual has had to pass, it matters much more what level he reached. And the goal is don't waste the talents, so what we assume is that uh, independently from the social classes, people, talented people are everywhere and the educational system uh, has this self-expectation to promote children according to their abilities, helping them to develop their full pot potential. The social background shouldn't play a role in it. To sum up all this together and to let us think about the reproduction of social inequalities in the school system, I would like to point out the primary secondary inequality effects uh, as defined by Boudon and also to show you some a model uh, that applies this um, kind of differentiation just to show you how uh, these theories can be instrumentalized and operationalized. Also I will mention something about the autonomy and selectivity of social systems and point out some research on social inequality in education. But don't worry, this is the last part of this uh, the theoretical uh, part. Uh, furthermore, it will be probably more fancy because we will have some empirical results as well. Um, so there are mainly two types, and this is important to understand later on also the models I will present that Baudon defined, two types of socially, uh, social inequality reproduction in the school system. Uh, first of all, he describes the primary effect, and this is mostly related to cognitive abilities of, uh, of students. And he's assuming that the cultural, social, and economic capital of the family influences the development of children before schooling and also learning during the schooling. Children from advantaged backgrounds benefit more from school. 
The secondary effect, however, impacts the track choices of students and parents, and it is assumed that this secondary effect is on top of the primary. So, uh, first of all, children uh, attend the school better prepared, they benefit more from schooling, and at the end, when they uh, have to choose a particular school, school track or uh, education, uh, they choose a higher school track when comparing children with the same ability levels. And school track choices and career decisions are subject to socially selective mechanisms underlying the action of subjects and contributing to the reproduction of social inequalities in the society. And this is related to this rational choice theories. Children from the advantaged backgrounds tend to choose higher school tracks than children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And this is a, a very simplified picture of these uh, two different types of inequality effects, according to Boudon. And as you see, that uh, it is assumed that the family resources, uh, as defined by Bourdieu, economic, cultural, and social capital, influence, first of all, the primary inequality effect, uh, which is uh, defined as school performance or results in, in particular school performance. And this is uh, influencing the secondary inequality effect, but also the secondary inequality effect occurs due to uh, family resources. So this is related to the uh, rational choice theory where families consider their own capacities to support children and, and to invest. They consider uh, the school performance of children uh, in terms of achievement as a risk factor because of course when a child is better achieving, has higher abilities, the risk of being non-successful non is lower. And um, this uh, ends up in secondary inequality effects that influence the uh, track choices of parents. So educational choices are defined by Baudon as choices aiming on profit maximization that are embedded into the social field. This is this add-on of the sociological theories, which is characterized by its position within the system of social inequalities. And educational choices are influenced by the con conditions given by the school system. This is a very important um, conclusion for for example, for policymakers, because it is um, uh, the, the parents takes into consideration, for, for example, the structure of the school system in the sense that if a, s a higher school track is easily available in terms of uh, even distance to their own home, disadvantaged families tend to easier choose this higher school track. And this is also related to tracking policy, which is, for example, a problem in Germany, as there are very strict uh, tracking regulations in the school system, uh, which force uh, children, for example, to pass uh, certain examinations, and also they force the teachers, for example, who have to give a recommendation for a higher school, school track to uh, select children because they have like to have these proportions, you know. Not too much children sending to a, uh, to a higher school track and then uh, the majority of children sending to this uh, medium school track and the lower school track, school track uh, should also be, not be uh, over um, populated. This is also a model uh, which applies this theory into the school context. Um, as developed by Waterman and Baumart. Of course, it is a very simplified picture of the reality, but it helps to operationalize these constructs. Uh, so he's assuming, or they are assuming, that social structural characteristics, which is um, uh, the socioeconomic status of the family, education and migration status. Uh, in some countries, this is, uh, for example, a very important factor in Germany, um, but also in some other countries like USA, for example. Um, but also process characteristics like the cultural and social behavior. Of course, not only, it is not only important to have a certain possessions, but also to apply them and to apply them in a, uh, daily, on a daily basis. Uh, so here you will find, uh, for example, factors such as uh, if parents do regularly read books with their, with their children, or if they attend theater or uh, similar things. Uh, they are related to cognitive abilities of children, as I mentioned before, and also to school achievement, uh, but also to other uh, abilities like me metacognitive abilities and motivation. And this is where the psychological uh, element comes into it. Um, so in order to be able to operationalize and also to provide theories on these uh, models, it is uh, necessary to have uh, understanding about the sociological theories, but also on the psychological um, 
uh, processes that are first of all due to um, track choices, but also that are in, embedded in or in, that are related to uh, learning processes. And the empirical research has shown that that uh, those abilities are very, very important for uh, school achievement and later school career. This is related to track choices uh, on a certain level of, of the educational system. And of course, um, later on also the knowledge, which is uh, related to school achievement in the in a previous school track. And uh, of course, metacognitive abilities and motivation influence the competencies. And uh, the important thing is that the track choices are very crucial. What matters for, for later competencies is the track choice. And this is very uh, obvious in Germany as we have this three, threefold system in the secondary school, which means that uh, less able or capable children are sent to lower uh, schools or the parents decide to send the child, child to a lower school track, medium and high school track. And, um, those school tracks create different learning environments. So even if a child with the same abilities is sent, is sent to a different school track, it will uh, result in different competencies at the end. So that is um, an example how, to, how those things can be modeled on the society level. So the concept of subjective rationality implies that social system can act autonomous to a certain degree and this is important for policy makers because not all schools will respond in the same way to a particular reform. And uh, the social systems are connected to personal statement systems that keep their relative autonomy that are defined by Schultz -like, uh, as mind filters. This is just to, to keep it in mind that the subject of rationality has some implications to systems as well. Just one or two slides on the research results in education. Uh, first of all, it is well known and has been told a lot about it in the political arena, at least in uh, Germany, that social inequalities can be, uh, can be confirmed in many countries uh, according to large-scale assessment studies like PISA or PIRLS. And we have uh, also a, a plenty of research uh, concerning the selections me mechanisms and also those two types of, of uh, inequality effects that I mentioned before. However, the secondary inequality effect is especially a uh, topic in Germany. Three main points from this research is that to support the support of children from disadvantaged families uh, is often applied as action towards improving social equality in education, and this has been done in Germany since a uh, few decades. Um, this often contradicts, of course, the inequality of the primary effect, which means basically that there is much effort to support children in learning from disadvantaged back family backgrounds or from um, children with migration background. Uh, this leads that uh, to the effect of it is that children with lower cognitive abilities receive extra support and they achieve better. However, in a socially selective system, which is uh, a, one, a system with a strong tracking policy, for example, uh, the secondary effect becomes more prominent because not all children can attend higher education. Other factors are considered and um, are taken into account um, while, for example, uh, marking and grading the children by teachers. So they, uh, it is, uh, especially qualitative research has shown that teachers start to apply the socially selective uh, attitudes and expectations when they have two children from um, different family backgrounds with the same achievement. They have to take something to, to select these children, you know, to differentiate, especially when the achievement is not when it's uh, between two, uh, two levels, like they are not sure where the children should be classified. Then they tend to classify the children from, high, from uh, advantaged family backgrounds to a higher track because they assume that they have more capacities, more, uh, more uh, capital to, to be supported by their families. And this is, I mean, this is even not a bad will. This is really a rational choice, uh, um, uh, rational choice done, done by the teachers who wants to have to, to give the children a better future, of course, but they want to uh, save them from disappointments, for example, when, when they are not successful in the higher school track. Um, so the research has shown that the school career of two high-achieving children will most probably reflect their social background. 
So now I would like us to, to take a step back and to reflect a little bit on the whole entire thing. You have a little bit of the theories in mind now and a little bit of understanding. So to reflect on who is responsible and what are the solutions um, for this problem when it's defined as a problem. So I would like us to reflect on the micro, meso and ma macro level as defined by Becker. So he describes the micro level as the closest environment of an individual family, friends, classmates and colleagues. Then on the meso level, which is the society and environmental context, like for example institutions, organizations, companies and school. But then uh, on the macro level as well, like uh, the wider society. So the system, policy level, etc. So where is the responsibility? Society, state, city, school, teacher, parents, whoever. And I have some um, very provocative, I would say, <laughs> ideas, um, which uh, I discovered during my uh, preparation for this presentation. Um, I don't know if you were of the fact, if you are aware of the fact that uh, there is a seri seriously and uh, very uh, widespread movement towards Marxism in the world. Uh, so I think for uh, uh, for societies that had the privilege uh, to leave the system already, <laughs> uh, this is kind of uh, surprising, I would say. So what I brought with me is uh, just to give you an idea how they advertise and um, what they try to show people is um, I brought you a link to, his, to their home page where they advertise for the conferences that take place every year and they are attended by really thousands of people. Uh, but when you look on the home page it looks a little bit like a political agenda. So it is basically it is a research conference, right? And uh, opening the full program looks for me even more funny. We fight Wall Street in the workplace. We fight Wall Street on the, on the waterfront. We're not just going to pick it in front of the bank. We're going to stop operation. This uh, discovery that the people can express their will, and when they express their will massively, they can impose their will. The only time that indigenous people ever changed the course of Australian history was at the Aboriginal Embassy in 1972. And that came about because of mass action. Okay, it is very hard to understand <laughs> when uh, being non-native speaker, but to me it sounds like they are really creating a revolution and really putting this as a solution for the societies. Uh, so this is just to, you know, to provocate a little bit. And uh, I found an article saying, saying why Marxism is on the race again. And it was stated there, yes, Karl Marx is going mainstream and goodness knows where it will end, and I think this is, <laughs> this is a good sentence for it. Yeah, what is the solution on the society level, level? We have the problem that there is a limited labor market, limited amount of high positions in, on the labor market, and every, everybody wants to get them, and the education is more accessible. Uh, so what is the solution? This is one of the pictures from a demonstration. It's just, just a rhetorical question, you know. I don't expect us to answer these questions now. It's just to, to um, provocate us a little bit. This is the meso level, uh, also a provocative probably thing on the meso level because it concerns the school system but also like local schools. And this is uh, something that was uh, applied in Philippines um, recently and they advertise for schooling 
uh, with this text here, greater opportunities. Education is a program to bring education reform closer to every Filipino. The Department of Education and its various supporters have state, started to address the need to inform and engage the general, general public, so it addresses you know, everybody, and its internal stakeholders in its mission to provide education for all, the, uh, for, for all in the Philippines. And I found it really remarkable how they really try to reach uh, the wide mass of people like to encourage children also from um, very simple non-educated family backgrounds to go to school. And just for, for fun and also for kind of cultural competencies, I would like to, to show you this, um, this short adverti advertisement uh, from Philippine. Sa pagsikat ng araw, may dalang bagong pananaw. Naririnig mo bang busina? Palapit na ang pagbabago. Sama na, halika na. Go Education. May bago Great. I played it on purpose because as I looked at this movie, although I know all this about social inequalities with all the knowledge on the empirical results, it's touching the emotions. So I suppose it's the even more reaching the, the families in the Philippines. And when looking at this movie, you, you really have the feeling, oh, everything is all right. The world is beautiful and the children will be happy. <laughs> so, unfortunately, it doesn't look like that always. And um, this is the last movie I brought with me because I, uh, have, I think this is a very, um, although simplified, but very good summary of what uh, the problem on the school level is in, with this stuff. And they just think that it's hard for the I'm on my knees, right? Stay on my team, still be from head to toe. I finally get to see a light. Still in the baddest box, seven three strikes. Walking like where I run, step my name, my three strikes. Walking this way, you nap. I found the devil battles like a typo. He's gonna catch me. If I fall, guess we all need to challenge. The battles in this race and across the boundaries.
so this is basically the demographics at the higher school track or, or at the more prominent school, right? I think the movie is quite uh, quick. So you see there are very few other nations on this lower school. The kids are aware of their failures, says a fourth grade teacher in Chicago. Some of them act like their games, the game's already over, which is a very sad situation. North Lanwell suffers from a high unemployment rate and jobless rate among 20 to 24 years old and 34% uh, uh, of residents between 18 and 24 years are age lack a high school diploma or a GAD. Why it never seems enough to impress some and you just want to hear him say good job instead of get a good job so tell me where is your rest huh? The parents feel the strain too because they named you and they got the responsibilities to raise you. If you turn out like a demon instead of an angel then they be catching the blame for bringing the family shame. When kids have kids they run and abandon others stick around model broken examples. Clean ones nobody's hands is and sometimes this life's got more questions than answers I feel the pressure, yeah Coming from every side I feel the pressure, yeah Knocked out but I'm still alive When I feel the pressure, yeah Like where do I run to When I feel the pressure, pressure, pressure you ever feel like you're wandering, no aims, no accomplishments, life's passing by, gotta make something out of it, and every time the clock tick, you'll be so reminded how time flies, but you ain't in the cockpit, and birthdays are like the worst days, there's turmoil in your heart for celebration on the surface, cause Mondays is right back to that workplace, where you hate it but you gotta get paid, yeah I can feel the pressure too, every time I'm speaking, on the microphone, different crowds on the weekends, cause I remember what James said about teaching and why is everybody scrutinizing what I'm tweeting? Sign to that reach camp, expectations way higher than decent. I became green when I seen God's peace, rested in it knowing that he's pleased with me. Now I don't gotta please, man. I feel, I feel the pressure, yeah. yeah. Coming from every side, I feel the pressure, yeah. Locked down but I'm still alive when I feel the pressure, yeah. Like where do I run to when I feel the pressure, pressure, pressure? Okay, that's it. The rest is just names. So I think that the movie points out the problem. Of course, it is not only the school system problem, but it is also a, pro a problem of the school system. And uh, I think, although it's speaking or presenting just two schools, uh, two very extreme schools in uh, the US, it can be applied to wi wider context, and we have uh, plenty of research that show, show, show that the social inequalities are still the case in the social system. That's the problem. What is the solution? Putting all weak students into one school doesn't work out, and this has been shown by research results, and uh, we all know this from uh, experience and from different things. 
Uh, the question to be asked is how far can we go with heterogeneity, heterogeneity without losing the level, right? Because when we put all the children together, we can argue, and it has been argued in the discussion on social inequalities, that um, the learning level, the achievement level, will be uh, lowered through this action. And this is indeed an empirical question, because we have a couple of different schools we can compare then and we can uh, take a closer look on these mechanisms and uh, try to answer the question em empirically if really, really, really it is the case that children from advantaged family backgrounds uh, perform lower when they are in these heterogeneous environments. Um, so this brings us to, to my research example, which is on school potential to mitigate social inequalities. So I, I tried to put it positive not negative, like uh, we have a, a, a lot of research and a lot of uh, publications saying the reproduction of inequalities in the social system, etc., etc. Much of the discussion has been blaming school also, but we can also turn it in a positive way and then uh, try to find um, um, factors of the school and levels of the school work uh, that can contribute to mitigating social inequalities. Let me start with it and I will try to keep it short. A school potential to mitigate social inequalities. And so very briefly to the study background, uh, as you have already all this theoretical input, uh, it doesn't need to be very um, extended. Uh, then I will uh, explain to you my methodological approach and the data and some selected results on it. And then I will summarize and conclude. So the theoretical uh, approach um, is based on, um, on a definition of an effective school system uh, which is defined as uh, being able to fulfill its social and individual functions for a maximum number of children, children independent of their social and economic background. So you see already in this definition of the effective school system, we on, not only consider the, the student achievement, but also the fact if we can reach really a, a wide um, number or, or a huge number of children. Um, Presumably, most, most, uh, the best case would be to reach all of the children, like in the advertisement of the Philippine uh, movie. But the reproduction of inequalities takes place in the school system, and the question is how can school contribute to mitigating social inequalities? Um, there, here are mentioned those two types of social inequalities that I already explained to you. They influence the cognitive skills and track choices, and my research is on both effects. And um, of course, there is the fact that neglecting, neglecting, um, neglecting cultural and social diversity contributes to reproducing social inequalities. Of course, when um, the politicians and the school system doesn't, um, doesn't realize the problem, then it is an impl implicit contribution to the reproduction. How can school, school contradict those two effects and how can school improve on that, on the last topic here. For example, by addressing the individual needs of children from different family backgrounds, uh, by using socially sensitive material and methods, uh, by supporting parents for appropriate school track choices, by improving the availability of educational and cultural resources, especially of course for children from disadvantaged backgrounds, enriching the school learning environments, supporting teachers to provide objective and socially independent marks and track recommendations, which is really a challenge sometimes. Um, so to describe the mechanisms of inequality, I use the social inequality theories and social milieu theories, and to describe the school system, uh, school effectiveness theories, uh, which I will not explain to you now because it's uh, mainly the topic of my next presentation when I will come here in September, so it will be then uh, extended. Uh, these are my hypotheses that I tested. So the uh, hypothesis on the primary inequality effect, the background is that children from advantaged family are, families are better prepared for schooling than children from disadvantaged families and they receive better parental support during the schooling time. So they benefit all in all together more from the school system and the hypothesis is that children from advantaged families perform better independently from their individual psychological learning conditions, such as motivation for the subject or their academic self-concept. And again, this is on the, on the society level, so it doesn't um, apply to a particular child. What we are aimed to compare is like 
um, uh, keeping those conditions, motivation and academic self-concept constants in order to like, um, separate this, this effect of the, uh, of the family background. And the analysis is testing the association of reading achievement and the cultural capital of the family while introducing the control variables into the model, motivation and academic self-concept. Um, the secondary inequality effect, the background, is that according to the rational choice theory, decisions about future school careers are social selective, rational choices of parents and children, and the hypothesis is that parents' decision about the future school tracks, uh, school careers, depend on the family capital, whereas the actual achievement of the ch children is less important. The analysis is testing the effect of the family cultural capital on parental aspiration as an indicator of future track decisions, as well as its association with achievement. And the control variables as are, again, motivation and academic self-concept. The third hypothesis concerns the student's uh, cultural composition uh, in the classroom or in the school. Uh, the background is that as a result of early institutionalized and non-institutionalized tracking and grading, Children from different backgrounds do not have the same access to accumulated capital. This addresses the issue that, of course, in uh, higher school tracks um, or in better uh, schools, um, better in terms of the proportion of um, children from advantaged backgrounds attending the school, uh, there is a higher level of accumulated cultural capital. And of course, every child that goes to, the, to this school has access to it. And the hypothesis is that unequal opportunities contribute to increasing the achievement gain between students from advantaged and disadvantaged families. And the analysis is testing the effect of stu student cultural composition on reading achievement while controlling for the other variables. So um, the next hypothesis is on the called contribution to social inequalities, and namely on contextual effects. And the background is that the learning environment is richer in schools that fulfill particular quality requirements. So which means that even though, um, uh, for example, let's say we have a school with a uh, lower percentage of children from advantaged backgrounds, so which, with a school low social economic background, but still it is possible to provide a rich learning environment. And this, can be, uh, this shouldn't be depend on the uh, students that attend the school, but rather on the regulations in the school system, right? And high quality learning environments can help to mitigate social inequalities. So this could be one of the uh, reforms that can be applied in the uh, school system if they are provided in schools with a high percentage of students from disadvantaged families. The schools with high percentage of students with advantaged families, they have already uh, most often a very enriching environment. So my fourth hypothesis is that students perform better in high quality learning environments independently from their individual cultural capital. And this is again, not on the individual level, right? But on the society level. Teacher and school characteristics are associated with re reading achievement. This is, is the analysis and the control variables are uh, the same as before. The last hypothesis, uh, however, not tested yet. Uh, it will be tested in the future. Uh, concerns those differential effects for various student groups. So uh, the hypothesis is that those high quality learning environments are even more important for disadvantaged students than for advantaged students. Thus, high quality learning environments contribute to mitigating social inequalities within school as well. The analysis is the association is to, real, to uh, create uh, random effects between the associations that I mentioned before, be, 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 uh, between the predictors and the outcomes. And control variables are the same as in the previous models. Which kind of data I used? I used the PIRL study, Progress in Reading Literacy Study data, which is uh, cross-sectional data and doesn't allow, allow for causal, for testing causal relationships. So this is one of the limitations I will mention in later on. Uh, however, it at least uh, allows for correlations in a, a complex model where we can control for some conditions and create kind of semi-experimental design. And I used just data from nine European countries um, and um, because I wanted to analyze countries that can be, I mean, in the context of the whole world, be more uh, compared to each other in terms of society, of um, of uh, the level of, of the economic situation, etc. So I used um, all, all of the nine countries are EU countries except of Norway, and they have all an HDI, which is Human Development Index between 0.88 and 0.95. 
and the exceptions are Poland with a lower HDI and Norway with a higher. But I, I tried to keep them uh, on a similar, um, to, to keep them close. And this is a, a preliminary analysis on the sample sizes. So you see on the left side of the table uh, the numbers of students per country. This is the number of schools per country and this is the average sample size within schools. So you have heard already, uh, or many of you have heard already, some uh, input on the sample characteristics of the Pearl study. So these are uh, students from one classroom only, and this is um, the average number per country within uh, classes, the, the average class size per country. This coefficient is a um, very interesting coefficient and a prerequisite to analyze such models because it indicates um, the heterogeneity of schools within a country. So you can uh, state all of these numbers, you can state for example that 11% of the diversity in achievement is on the school level in Austria. And this, is, um, this implicates a rather more homogeneous school system, so the schools don't differ so much from it, each other. Uh, whereas in Germany, it, uh, the case is a very different one. We have like 30% of the achievement uh, differences is on the school level. So we have a very different schools in this, uh, in this country. I used contextualized attainment model, as I explained uh, before, using a set of control variables to create a semi-experimental design. Of course, it's not perfect and I'm not controlling everything. And, uh, but I tried to, uh, to get into the model the most important variables that are related to learning and to uh, track choices. Uh, I'm using multiple group, multi-level structural equation modeling, um, which allows for cross-country comparisons. Um, it allows for latent modeling of psychological and sociological phenomena and considers the multi-level structure of the system. Multi-level structure um, um, is related to the fact that we have like students nested in classrooms and then we have classrooms nested in schools and this can be modeled directly with this multi-level modeling. Um, and it is also a comprehensive modeling which allows, allows uh, including a set of variables simultaneously. The procedure is um, to uh, estimate um, on the individual level the primary and secondary effects and then as a, in the next step to put on the school level um, proximal learning factors like uh, in this case I used just one uh, indicator instru instruction stimulating for reading and this is a limitation due to the Pearl study design. Uh, there are not so many scales that could be used on the teacher level. Uh, school composition uh, has been added into the model and in this case I just used one indicator, the cu cultural capital, because I know that uh, from previous analysis that this is um, probably the most important or most consistent indicator of family background. And then last but not least, school contextual variables like resources, cooperation with parents, etc. Et so this is the basic model for level one, and when you see, you, uh, I put here these circles which indicate latent constructs, so everything that is in boxes is manifest, uh, and everything that is in, in, the, in circles is latent. And the cultural capital, is, uh, we, the assumption is that it influences the academic reading self-concept, and the motivation, they are of course um, related to each other. Further assumption is that the cultural capital influences the reading achievement on top of the uh, influence on motivation and on academic self-concept on reading achievement. But also that we have this secondary inequality effect, namely that if parents take the des decision on educational choices, the cultural capital plays a role on top of all these factors. And uh, you see here I use as an in indicator for track choices, parental educational aspirations which is an abbreviation basically to, to a question asked the parents what kind of education they expect for their children. So it's not the aspiration as defined by Baudieu and Boudon, it, it's whether the, the one nor, nor the other. It's just an abbreviation for what do parents expect for their children. It's a very simplified concept. And in the second model, I added on the school level a couple of variables. Um, so school variables, school cultural, cultural capital, which is this uh, school composition, student composition, and instruction stimulating for reading. And my research results so far are on this contextual and compositional effects. So these are the results, first of all, for this model, on the primary inequality effects and secondary inequality effects. And as you see, 
I marked, this, marked it as primary effect, and this is the association between the cultural capital and achievement. And you see, in all the, this is on the individual level. And this is a significant and um, medium sized, uh, low or medium sized in all the countries. Uh, but when uh, asked or when wondering about these coefficients, we, we should not think in terms of, um, or we should consider what we do expect. So we would pref preferably expect a zero correlation here that would uh, indicate uh, the most equal, so, uh, uh, socially, in socially inequality terms, uh, equal educational systems. So when we have uh, positive correlations here is uh, rather not very uh, good sign. Uh, then there is those, this secondary effect that is the correlation between the cultural capital and aspiration while controlling for achievement, motivation and self-concept, con uh, it still remains remar remarkable, I would say, uh, because it is also on the individual level. Um, it's even higher than the primary effect, uh, which would support what I mentioned before, that the primary effect is going to be reduced, whereas the secondary effect increases. And the last column is also interesting because it mark or indicates the association between the aspiration and achievement. It means we would um, probably expect that this association is kind of high, right? Because uh, parents should consider the achievement of their children uh, while choosing a particular school track or making educational decisions. Whereas it is not significant or very low in a couple of countries like Denmark, Finland, it is very low in Germany and Norway, and in Sweden it's zero. So it means in those countries, according to these results, um, parents don't uh, take into account the achievement of children. Um, this is the fourth grade. I mean, the children are very young, but still in the fourth grade, a, pa a parent can justify the achievement, I, I guess, in, in most of the countries. Um, yeah, that's, I found this very interesting. So what I did then is uh, adding those uh, school cultural capital instructions stimulating for reading to estimate the compositional effects and the contextual effect. And um, this is just to point out that in this model the standardized beta for the primary effect is um, almost the same or very similar to the previous model just to, to control that my models don't differ so much from each other. And this is the compositional effect of the cultural capital. And these correlations indicate that in those countries like Denmark, for example, or France, it is important uh, for achievement or it, it plays a role if a child is in a, a school with higher cultural capital or not. Whereas, for example, in Finland, it doesn't matter. In Austria, it doesn't matter. Norway and Poland, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not significant. So we see that in, in those societies, uh, not only the individual cu cultural capital contributes to social inequalities, but also the cultural capital of the class or school. The last uh, column indicates the contextual effect of instruction stimulating for reading. So this is on, on uh, the contribution of school. What can school do to mitigate social inequalities? Namely, uh, we see here that uh, children tend to perform better when teachers uh, stimulate, stimulate them for reading. So this is, in contrast to this effect, this is a positive, in terms of um, context-related positive association. So it's not only positive in numbers, but also positive in meaning, right? So that, that means that teacher, uh, teacher's methodology uh, or teacher's stimulating for reading matters for achievement. So teacher can do something about it. In uh, Ireland, Norway, Poland, Sweden, uh, where, where it doesn't help at all is Germany, Finland, and Austria. In those three countries, this method doesn't, I mean, it, it's, it's very limited. It's just one indicator of teaching methods and, and probably motivating students. But still, it's saying something about the uh, contextual effects. So, to conclude, the first hypothesis, primary inequality effects, the cultural capital of the family influences reading achievement even after controlling for students' motivation and academic self-concept. And in this case, I can speak about causal uh, relationships based on theoretical approaches because, of course, 
um, uh, it is not the case that the reading achievement influences the cultural uh, capital of the family, right? So this is a case where I didn't test it, but usually we could assume that uh, the causal relationship is from the cultural capital to the achievement. Secondary inequality effect, parental aspirations depend on family cultural capital, even after considering motivation, academic self-concept and reading achievement of the student, I should mention. Uh, compositional effects, students' cultur cultural composition is associated with reading achievement in five of the nine analyzed countries, even after controlling for the individual effect of the family background and, and achievement. And the fourth hypothesis on the contextual effect, I just tested one school factor or, or classroom factor, high quality learning environment, indicated just by this one factor, as I mentioned before, uh, contribute to improve reading achievement in six of the nine analyzed countries. So what can schools do and school systems do to mitigate social inequalities? What would be the summary and the policy recommendation probably? More heterogeneous student composition to give the disadvantaged students more opportunities to be benefit from the accumulated capital because obviously it plays a role. And previous research, I didn't analyze this, but previous research has shown that advent advantaged students don't perform worse in schools with heterogeneous students composition and on top of that they develop higher social competencies. Then another recommendation could be provide high quality learning environments like instructions stimulating for reading, for example, especially in schools with high percentage of disadvantaged students. This study has shown that school track choices depend on the cultural capital of the family. So to address this uh, issue, based on previous research, we know that mitigating the social inequality effects can be reached through, for example, cooperation between teachers and parents. Uh, we know from the rational choice theories that, for example, the access to information is um, worse from parents from disadvantaged families. So, for example, this is something that uh, the school system could address. Accounting for non-availability of educational opportunities could be something, for example, that can be done on the school system level. For example, there has been uh, some attempts uh, to provide let's say, transportation to higher school tracks for disadvantaged children in um, rural areas, for example. That could be a, a, a very concrete thing that can be applied. Um, so those two hypotheses uh, are left for further research. And this would be uh, analyzed in this model, which is a very complex model, and which considers not only uh, other school variables and their influence on reading achievement, but also uh, an interaction effect between the, those uh, inequality effects, what I explained before that. Uh, we can uh, try to analyze if those effects, school level effects, um, are different from the, for different stu student groups. So the scientific contribution of the research is that combining school effectiveness and social inequalities Inequality theories is a, a kind of new approach. Um, I will explain it a little bit more uh, next time when I'm here and uh, go through the different school effectiveness theories uh, which describe the school system and, syst and in a very systematic way. This, this hasn't been done, been done for the social inequalities uh, research before. Uh, also, there's an empirical evidence of school factors that can mitigate social inequalities. However, there are some Limitations, as always, um, namely limited information about psychological learning conditions. Uh, for example, it would be very good to include prior achievement or another control variable. If not having a long longitudinal data, at least it would be good to, uh, to include cognitive skills um, of, the, of the students. There is also criticisms on the measures of the cultural uh, capital is missing here of the cultural capital of the family. So the, the latent construct is not very extended. It has just three variables. And um, there's, of course, a lot of, of discussion on the operationalization of these constructs. Uh, the causality of the effects would require longitudinal studies. And there is limited information about the learning environment and processes. So quantitative studies with whether more, more uh, elaborated information about learning processes should be required or uh, we would need some qualitative studies as well on it. So with it, I am almost finished with my presentation. However, I wanted uh, ag again 
to have like some a little bit brainstorming and a little bit uh, reflection on the cultural component in cross country comparisons because this is becoming a, a major topic now in large scale assessment studies. Um, and to s let us think on it, I brought you a folk tale about three blind men. And I think probably uh, you know it, but I found it very interesting and also very fancy to uh, reflect on this topic, uh, you know, using this, this folk tale. So this folk tale encountered an, um, about three blind men who encountered an elephant for the first time and attempted to learn about it by touch alone. So this is the first uh, blind man. With outstretched hand, the first man touched first the left foreleg and then the right. After that, he felt the two legs from the top to the bottom and with a beaming face turned to say, so, the queer animal is just like that. Then he slowly returned to the group. There upon the second blind man was led to the rear of the elephant. He touched the tail, which waged a few times and he exclaimed with satisfaction, ha, truly a queer animal, truly odd. I now, I know now, I know. He hurriedly stepped aside. The third blind man turned, come, came, and he touched the elephant trunk, elephant's trunk, which moved back and forth, turning and twisting, and he thought, that's it, I have learned. So this is a picture where they touched the elephant <laughs> on these three the very different places. They decided to discuss their experience. The second one bl blurted out, this queer animal is like our straw fan swinging back and forth to give us a, br a breeze. However, it's not so big or well made. The main portion is rather wispy. No, no, the first blind man shouted in disagreement. This queer animal resembles two big trees without any branches. You are both wrong, the thir third man replied. This queer animal is similar to a snake. It's long and round and very strong. How they argued, each one insisted that he alone was correct. Of course, there was no conclusion for none had truly examined the whole elephant. How can anyone describe the whole until he has examined all of the parts? So what are the conclusions for cross-cultural comparisons? Depending on the measurement methods and perspectives, the re results might be quite different. Any comparisons, including cross-country comparisons, have to prove if they are comparing the same part of the elephant. And still, the instruments might have different properties in varying circumstances, just like a yardstick that is sensitive to different climate conditions. With these statements, I would like to close this presentation and if you have any questions or uh, if you want to discuss or if you want to take a break, uh, feel free to do so. And thank you very much for your attention.